heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is Brian McClanahan, your host, and this is episode 55, covering the week of January 16th through 20th, 2017. Glad to have you back on the program. Thanks for supporting the Institute, and thanks for supporting this podcast. A little housekeeping before we get started. If you like this podcast and you like our material that we have on our website and our programs and conferences and other things, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. Uh, we do exist on your generous contributions alone. Also, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter and our YouTube page. Uh, we do use social media, so we would like you to uh, like our material, share our material around. That's the only way we're going to help uh, advance our educational cause. So. Uh, please consider doing all of the above, and if you like this podcast, please uh, share this podcast and share it with your friends and uh, get the word out because um, we are trying to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, and that cannot be done on our own. We need help, and we need you. So um, we would love your support in any way you can help us out. All right, we had a great week this week um, at the Institute. We had a lot of really interesting articles and information. This, of course, was the Robert E. Lee uh, Stonewall Jackson Week. Uh, Lee's birthday on the 19th, Jackson on the 21st, which was Saturday, uh, Lee on Thursday. So a uh, very important week in terms of Southern icons. And so we focus a lot of the material this week on the war itself and our understanding of Southern history. And uh, I think that um, even though the, the material, again, seems to be rather eclectic, we did have a piece on Jackson and Lee. Uh, we also had one, though, on John Singleton Mosby and also on just Southern history in general, and then the uh, what Paul Yarbrough calls the Dixie Curse. So um, this is uh, some interesting stuff, so let's get started. The, the first piece of the week is by James Rutledge Roche, and it is on uh, Valerie Hughes's book, A Thousand Points of Truth, The History and Humanity of Colonel John Singleton Mosby in newsprint. And it is a self-published book, but uh, and it is media. I mean, this book is probably about 800 pages, uh, so there's a, a lot of information here. You can uh, get it on Amazon. But uh, the book covers not only Mosby's career as a uh, Southern uh, soldier during the War for Southern Independence, but also his post-war career. And, and what, uh, Miss, uh, Mo what Miss Hughes has done is taken newspaper accounts and kind of put a picture together of John Singleton Mosby from what other people said about John Singleton Mosby, and as you do that, you find that Mosby is um, a much more interesting uh, character than maybe a lot of people have actually thought he was. In fact, uh, Miss Hughes tried to dispel a number of myths. One, that uh, the legend of Mosby was actually fabricated by himself and his partisans. She said that's not true. Uh, she said that it's not true that this legend was fabricated by later biographers. In fact, um, that uh, the legend was there at the time uh, because of Mosby's life and career. Uh, that he was, uh, she dispels the myth that he was never a true believer in the Confederacy and uh, sold out after the war by becoming a Republican. Uh, she says that's simply not true as well. Uh, and that uh, he was actually a difference maker during the war and that he was not a failure during the war. Uh, he was not a war criminal. These are all things she's trying to dispel and that he was personally unpleasant. That's simply not true, she says. So there's a lot of information out here for, for Mosby and uh, I think that this uh, particular book does a nice job of resurrecting Mosby's reputation and career, um, and I think that you should pick it up. Um, you know, Mosby, she says, admired Socrates. Uh, that was his guy, uh, and that she thinks that by writing this biography, maybe Mosby will be recognized as more than a soldier, however brilliant and heroic, but as a true champion of the truth and the right. Uh, and so... Um, I think that what we're seeing, and this actually works into the piece we ran on Wednesday about recovering Southern history, I think what we're seeing, particularly through self-publishing or through uh, information like Shotwell Press, which is uh, Clyde Wilson's press, if you haven't purchased any of those books, they are very affordable, and you can get them on Amazon. But uh, again, the idea is to uh, have a different view of Southern history. And so we're going to try to do more book reviews as we move forward on the website. And if you are interested in writing a book review, uh, you can contact us and we can, um, uh, if, you, if that's what you like to do, uh, we could possibly get you a book or two. We'll, we'll take a look at uh, what you've done otherwise and, and um, see what your, uh, what your credentials are. But we would love uh, to have some more people writing book reviews because uh, 
uh, commenting on the historical trends or fashionable trends or what, what we're doing, I think is, uh, is important in our understanding of the South. Uh, and so uh, it was nice of uh, Mr. Roche to write this review of Miss Hughes's book. And uh, I think that uh, it's well worth your time to go out and purchase it and uh, find out who John Singleton Mosby actually was. Um, and so um, she's trying to dispel what she says is the myth of Mosby that has been created uh, by people who did not like Mosby. Uh, in fact, she says he's gravely misunderstood and wrongly misrepresented. All right, so that was our, our piece for Monday. On Tuesday, we ran a wonderful piece about uh, Stonewall Jackson by Holmes Alexander. Now, Holmes Alexander has been dead for a long time. Uh, in fact, he died in 1985. But um, he wrote well over a dozen books on Southern history and uh, American history, really, in general. And uh, he particularly admired uh, Stonewall Jackson. And the thing I liked about this particular piece is it wasn't about Stonewall as the soldier, even though uh, Mr. Alexander did talk about that. It was more about Alexander, uh, I'm sorry, more about uh, Jackson as the man. And uh, this, the title of this piece is Stonewall by Name and Nature. And so it gets into some things that um, are rather interesting about Jackson's personal life. Um, it talks about his time at, um, at, as, as a uh, teacher. It talks about his time as a young man and his, uh, his uh, social awkwardness as a time. Uh, it talks about his, his character. Uh, and how Jackson was um, Jackson was Jackson because of who he was as a man. Uh, in fact, if Jackson didn't have the rocked rib personality that he had, uh, perhaps uh, the war might have been different. Uh, in fact, he says that uh, you know Jackson learned in Mexico when he was uh, participating in the in the war against Mexico in 1846 that uh, he was born to fight. And that he became a soldier of the cross, as, as he said uh, later on. And so Jackson's uh, religious convictions and, and uh, principles definitely led to who he was as a man and, of course, his performance in the War for Southern Independence. Um, I think that this is the important part about Jackson and, and something that I've said about Jackson quite a lot. You know, Jackson is a, is a product of the South, and it used to be, and this is something that I said in the Thursday piece, and we'll get to that in a minute, but it used to be that Jackson and Lee were rec recognized as not just Southern heroes, but American heroes. Uh, and uh, the Northerner E.L. Godkin actually wrote this at one point. You know, Godkin was a Northern partisan during the war. He was my, uh, very much a libertarian, and uh, in fact, Russell Kirk uh, wrote about Godkin and his conservative mind, and I wrote about Godkin in the Forgotten Conservatives in American History with Clyde Wilson. Uh, but the thing that Godkin said about Jackson is just that. Uh, Jackson should be recognized, North and South, as a great American because he offered the best of what it was to be an American. Uh, and this is what we've what's happened over time. And um, there's going to be a, a piece this upcoming week about this Women's March in Washington, D.C. on Saturday. But uh, there was actually a phrase, uh, Ashley Judd, the actress Ashley Judd, said that, read a poem that had, uh, you know, a disparaging comment about the Confederate flag. And uh, I think that's where we've come, that people don't recognize that, uh, and everyone recognized at the time, if there's any group of people who could have hated Jackson and Lee, it would have been the men who served at the time who had to fight them uh, Jackson and Lee were responsible for the deaths of thousands and thousands of, of Northerners. And yet, these Northerners respected both Jackson and Lee, and they admired both those men. And so the next generation of Americans admired both those men. It wasn't just a fabrication of the South, and that somehow Northerners were under some type of hypnotic trance, that uh, these men were great and they really weren't. Uh, they were recognized for being great because they were. And that's what we've lost in our modern, politically correct, historical interpretation of America, our ideologically charged interpretation of America. We've lost that these men were actually great Americans, first and foremost. Uh, yes, they were a product of the South, and so the South can claim them. But not only that, all of America can claim them. Uh, because 
they they again embodied the best of what it was, was to be an American. And so we forget that as we move forward in, in the 21st century and people uh, like to uh, talk about how uh, you know Jackson and Lee were traitors. It's simply not true. Simply not true at all. Uh, they were doing their duty, and what they said was right. And millions of Americans felt the same way in 1861. This wasn't just uh, a faction that had seized power in the South. These, uh, these states seceded because of huge, crushing majorities in their secession conventions. Now, not at first in all the states, particularly not in Virginia, but eventually that happened. Uh, and if you look at Virginia and North Carolina and the Upper South, think about those states as they seceded after it became clear that Lincoln was going to unconstitu- unconstitutionally use the uh, federal military to invade a state. And that's what mattered. And that's what Lee and Jackson were looking at and saying, well, you just can't do that. Uh, And so I think that um, uh, it's important uh, to understand who these people were as men. Even Abraham Lincoln admired Stonewall Jackson. Uh, He thought Jackson was a great American. And so uh, it's important to understand that the men of the time did not think that Jackson and Lee were evil traitors, uh, that they admired both these men for their qualities as men. And we can learn a lot from these people, not just as defenders of secession and, of course, Southern independence, but as men. And so when you look at the piece that we published on uh, Wednesday, which is Recovering Southern History. Now, this is by Clyde Wilson, and he wrote it in 1984. So 32, 33 years ago. And when you read this piece, you'll you'll realize that not much has changed in 33 years uh, in what we're facing. And there was actually a a wonderful paragraph in this. And, of course, 1984, we've had uh, Ronald Reagan now in office for uh, a little over three years. We're moving into the 1984 election, and Reagan had a number of promises uh, at that time leading into um, to his uh, first, administ- first term of his administrations. And one of the things that um, became clear is that much of what Reagan uh, promised actually had Southern roots. And so Clyde said this, To the Southerner, such efforts seem uh, perverse and self-defeating if the goal is to establish a persuasive conservative genealogy. To him, it is self-evident that any viable American conservatism must incorporate the South. Just as a practical matter, one might argue the first conservative president of the century owes much of his conservatism to the residue of states' rights and laissez-faire beliefs in the Democratic Party, which formed him rather than to the energetic Hamiltonian traditions of the Republican Party in which history has forced him to work out his destiny. And so he says, in a newly conservative climate, the effort to exclude the South from the emergent establishment creates some intellectual fashions that seem exceedingly odd to the historically minded. One may discuss the restoration of strict construction, limited government, and laissez-faire, for instance, as if they were discovered yesterday and without noticing even in passing the historic embodiment of those principles in the South. In fact, the political history of the Old South is very largely concerned with an effort to to prevent tariffs, internal improvements, currency manipulation, pensions, and subsidies, which effort was condemned as legalistic by the pragmatic conservative business interests at the time. So what we're seeing is the same thing. What we've had in 2017, what we've had with the election of Trump, is essentially the same process taking place just 30 years later. And so Clyde says that no one's likely to accept the Southern tradition whole cloth today, but for those who are searching for a genuine American conservatism to condemn its historic embodiment in the South while postulating a conservative ideology that is abstract and flawed as its progressive counterpart 
will seem to many of us to whom tradition and historical experience are central to the conservative idea to be a strangely compromised endeavor. And I think the thing that's interesting about Trump in saying that, you know, so what we've had is a battle over what is conservatism, and you've had people saying, no, it's Hamilton. But what people are missing is that the American conservatism really does come out of the South. It's really mu very much the Southern tradition. And I think that's where you know, Ashley Judd is, Judd is uh, criticizing the Confederacy and the Confederate flag. She actually recognizes that, that the South really is a core part of this American conservative resurgence that we've seen uh, in 2016. But we saw it back in the 80s, too. And I think this is where it's our job at the Abbeville Institute to ensure that people understand, they connect the dots. You don't have an American conservative tradition without the South. There really isn't any conservative tradition except in the South. And I think that's the important part of uh, understanding what we're exploring here at the Abbeville Institute and why Jackson and Lee are so important. It's not just because they were great soldiers. It's because what they represented in their life and career is the principles behind what they did. Uh, and I think that's where we lose touch with who we are as we forget about Jackson and Lee and who they were as men and why they're important moving forward in our understanding of Southern conservatism and then, by default, American conservatism. Uh, one thing we usually focus on with Jackson and Lee, which we didn't do this time, is their role as Christians. Uh, they were Christian gentlemen. And, of course, you cannot have an American conservative tradition without Christianity as part of it. Uh, we can talk about, uh, you know, Jeffersonian political principles, but uh, and that's important. We can talk about agrarianism, the, the idea of, of physical property. That's important. And this resistance to the uh, American... Uh, state capitalist effort, the fusion of banking and finance, all of that came out of the South, and I think that's important. You know, it's, it's this idea that there is uh, an independent-minded American man uh, that defends the rights of Englishmen. And I think that really is, more than anything else, the conservative tradition in America. And we have to remember that American, uh, I should say, Southern history, you know, goes back to 1607, 13 full years before you have the Pilgrims land in Plymouth. So the American conservative or Southern experience was already being developed before the, the, before, before the Pilgrims even got here because of Virginia. And I think the period that's often missed the most is this post-bellum South, and I, that's why I like, you know, the piece on Mosby because he was participating in this post-bellum South, and what the post-bellum South really meant to American conservatism. Not just the antebellum South, but the post-bellum South, and of course Lee, Lee, of course Lee was participating in that too. So when you put all this stuff together and you start looking at, at what Clyde is talking about here, uh, we have to understand that the South really is the core of what it means to be an American conservative. And that we've had revisionism, which has created all kinds of problems, because the revisionists are trying always, as, as Clyde points out in this piece, to relegate the South to some type of insignificant other, a specimen that needs to be studied, and at best it's a, a curious intellectual pursuit, but at worst, it's the really the whipping boy for the entire American experience. This is simply not true. And therein lies the problem of all of American history today and why the Abbeville Institute exists. There are so many people that want to hear the South was, uh, that the South was a viable and valuable part of the American experience, but all they've ever been told is that it's the insignificant other, the bad, whereas uh, Puritan Massachusetts was the good. Puritan Massachusetts was America when it's actually the other way around. And everyone knew that up until 1861. In fact, the majority of Americans knew that. If you put everyone together that voted against Lincoln in 1860, it was over 60% of the American population. 
So the majority, the vast majority of Americans knew that. But with Lincoln's victory and then, of course, the victory of the Union over the South and the uh, radical political, social, and economic transformations of the United States, what we've gotten is a history of America and American conservatism, American political philosophy that is at odds with what the American experience really was, which Jackson and Lee embodied. So when you look at Lee and the piece on Thursday, it's written by yours truly, Robert E. Lee, American hero. I didn't characterize Lee as a Southern hero. I characterized Lee as an American hero. And if you do an Internet search for Lee, traitor, it'll bring up several articles that lambaste Lee for turning his back on his country. You have people like Richard Cohen at the Washington Post writing that Lee should just be uh, you know, discarded in history. You have uh, the now deceased Elizabeth Brown Pryor portraying Lee as a traitor to his family uh, and as a man who has a foot fetish and, and uh, all kinds of personal failings. He really wasn't that great of a man. We didn't know who he was. And uh, Somebody sent me a story right after she was killed a couple of years ago in a car accident about how just viciously nasty this woman was when you try to talk to her about Lee. And how she just thought she knew Lee better than anybody else. And this guy was just a miserable human being who didn't need to be revered. One thing I bring up, you know, Cohen writes that um, Lee offered himself and his sword to the cause of slavery. Such a man cannot be admired. So I bring up uh, the fact that um, would they say, would anyone say the same thing about Washington or Jefferson? Because the Virginia royal governor, Dunmore, uh, believed that both Washington and Jefferson were fighting for slavery in 1775. Uh, you know, Dunmore, uh, Dunmore freed the slaves through a carefully calculated emancipation proclamation uh, in the early stages of the American War for Independence. But, uh, and so he said the war was about slavery, but nobody ever pushes that position. Would, would anyone say Washington was offering his sword to the cause of slavery? No one would say that, but yet Lee who is fighting for independence, is often you know, painted with those brushstrokes while he's just offering his sword to slavery. It's just simply not true. And I point out that the reason Lee was an American hero is because he was a product of Virginia, just as Washington and Jefferson. And everyone at the time knew that secession was possible. In fact, the North was the first section to bring it up in uh, 1794. Uh, so this is important for us to understand who Robert E. Lee was and why he is an American icon, not just simply a Southern icon. And if we can, if we could come to that position somehow, and uh, when I wrote my Politically Incorrect Guide to Real American Heroes and I did a chapter on Lee, I brought up the fact that there was a calendar in my, in my parents' home from 1940. And this was from a Northern insurance company that actually had Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson's birthday on this thing. Here we are, you know, 1940, these men were still American heroes. There were still American heroes in the 50s. And really, they were still American heroes in the 60s. It's only been the last, say, 40 to 50 years that we've really seen the, the concerted effort to destroy Jackson and Lee and to relegate them to the nothingness of American history, uh, I think more pronounced in the last 20 to 30 years than any other time. But um, it's, it's amazing to me how this process has taken place um, really – in the last half century, that for a hundred years these men were great Americans, and then for the last fifty years they weren't. And the same charges made against them cannot be made against Washington and Jefferson, when at the time people were saying the same thing about Washington and Jefferson and every other Southern founder. They were fighting for slavery. Well, yet we don't say that now. They were fighting for independence. The United States was a slaveholding federal republic in 1783, just as the Confederacy was in 1861. So when we, when we lose our understanding of the past, we, we fall prey and victim to these type of historical nonsense uh, pieces, the one written by Cohn and the one written by Pryor. Uh, it's just, it's ridiculous. And finally, on Friday, we ran a piece by Paul Yarbrough, The Dixie Curse, and he talks about the fact that um, Old Miss, you know, is... They're not allowed to play Dixie there at the uh, football games anymore. 
Um, and he calls it the Dixie Curse. He says, look, may, just like the curse of the Bambino with the Boston Red Sox, may it always drive Mississippi into a position where they never have any other success. Uh, because it's this type of thinking. Again, it's just what we're looking at here, the transition of Southern history, the, tra- the, the transformation of Lee and Jackson from Southern heroes to now, Southern, to now traitors, to slavers, uh, to, these, to these people that are just walking around with horns and tails. And I think that's the unfortunate part of, of what's happened throughout our understanding of American history. And so when you have this type of historical amnesia, which is what we talked about last week, uh, you know, with uh, looking at Sheldon Van Auken's piece on Old Western Man, you know, um, C.S. Lewis called it amnesia. When you have this historical amnesia, this is what you get. You get the removal of Dixie. You get the removal of, uh, you know, a a purely American symbol in the uh, Confederate flag. Uh, that for many people around the world recognizes a symbol not of oppression but of of freedom. Uh, You get uh, the reduction of Lee and Jackson to uh, people who are unworthy of even being uh, recognized in any capacity outside of a footnote in American history. But this is what happens when Southern history is lost. And this is why in 1984, Clyde Wilson said we had to recover Southern history. And this is why things like the Abbeville Institute are so important. And why we do this weekly podcast. And why we run five articles a week. Because without this kind of voice, this particular stuff, and there's no, look, I'm not going to believe that this podcast or everything we run at the Institute is going to change Uh, everyone's mind, and suddenly, miraculously, the South is going to be revered. Uh, The inertia is against us, but I think there are particular areas that you you can use to our advantage to discuss where the South is still important. It's not just offensive. We need to be positive and play offense, and uh, I think in uh, understanding things like uh, economy, uh, the attack on uh, the fusion of banking and finance, the importance of the American middle class, uh, a Southern view of labor, which uh, throughout, uh, particularly in the 20th century, has been much more humane than that of the North. Uh, when you look at, uh, of course, Southern political principles and how important they are, not just for the right, but for the left, as we're seeing with California wanting to, talking about decentralization and secession. That's, I mean, that's important. Uh, the South was the, the section that advocated those positions the longest and most effectively. And so we should be embracing this and getting together with our fellow you know, Americans on the left and saying, look, this is what we've been saying for years. We support you. Don't, we don't want to crush you. We support you. If you want to have your Socialist Republic of California, have at it. But let us have ours, too. Let us have what we want, too the society in which we want to live. And so I think that all of these things matter moving forward. They matter for our understanding of what American society is and what it means. And I've said it before, the South is America because uh, much of what we think is American has come out of the South. And so when you support the Institute and you support this podcast and you support our work, you're supporting that position. The South is America, and we can't say it enough, and you need to be telling people and have some some intellectual ammunition to go after people with that because uh, it's important for our understanding of not just the South but also America in general and why recovering Southern history is so valuable for the future of, of the United States, the Federal Republic, or uh, you know, whatever form uh, that may be moving into the future. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, particular podcast. Until next time, good day.